number of things here that you find in um, any church. Um, you see these figures um, on the, the soffit there. Those are the stations of the cross, or the way of the cross. It's a devotional. Um, pray perhaps more times than not during the season of Lent, and especially the Fridays of Lent. It marks uh, the journey of Jesus all the way to his crucifixion and his burial, and then traditionally in the last stations of the cross, it ends up in also remembering about the resurrection. Um, this church is uh, it's in an appropriate way the cross because you do see a cross under each figure. Some churches, they don't have the little cross. Uh, so technically, let me just say the stations of the cross should always have a cross by each of the stations. Because people are just kind of drawn to the figures. Okay? So it just reminds us of that journey uh, that Jesus experienced the last couple of days of his life. Okay, over here, against the wall next to the image of Divine Mercy. Uh, you find the sacred oils. <coughs> you can come closer. So these oils <coughs> uh, were consecrated or blessed at the Cathedral of the Blessed Sacrament on Holy Thursday. That's when the Archdiocese of Detroit celebrates its Christmas Mass. Some dioceses might do it on Wednesday or Monday or maybe even the week before based upon how large the diocese is and how far they, they have to gather. For Detroit, Parish is only about an hour away, so we go to the cathedral, Holy Thursday morning. Um, <clears throat> there's three oils, uh, oil of catechumen, oil of the sick or the infirmed, and sacred chrism. Um, you see some notations on these containers, OI is oil of infirmed, S OC is oil of catechumens, and then SC is sacred chrism. Um, <clears throat> you can at least tell sacred chrism apart because um, it has a wonderful fragrance in it. It's uh, balls and fragrance is poured into the oil and the bishop uh, swirls it around. It's a wonderful fragrance. The other two oils do not have any fragrance put into them. And generally it's olive oil. So these are important and they're usually, we usually find the ambry um, connected with the baptismal font to being close by, because that's when the oils are used the most, okay? So the oil of the infirmed is what we use for the sacrament of the sick. Um, the sacrament of the sick is something that people can receive many times in their life. Um, many years ago, people thought you could only receive it once, or you totally could only receive it once, but now it's on the beginning of any major disease or illness or before surgeries. So you have the oil of the infirmed, Oil catechumens we use before baptisms with babies or people coming into the church. And sacred chrism is used for baptism and confirmation and ordinations. Um, okay. You do find in churches oftentimes other depictions. This is a depiction of uh, uh, divine mercy. Uh, you also find, of course, images or statues of our Blessed Mother and St. Joseph. This is St. Joseph. That's the Blessed Mother on the other side. This church being built in the 60s. early 60s, late 50s. Um, <clears throat> you would find traditionally these other side altars where at times they would have had mass there, but now you might not find um, kind of a full altar that's there. This, as you see, is kind of used also for, for plants or for, uh, that's obviously probably from the blessing of the advent week. Um, so even though that was like the original baptismal font, this one I know it used to move. I guess not. It's got a stand that, or a wheeled stand okay. that pulls. It's obviously not on it. <laughs> um, obviously, sometimes we have another font to make it easier for baptism, especially if you're doing during masses, so everybody can see where the uh, what's happening at the baptism. Uh, and while we're here, so this is. Paschal candle. During the Easter season, you will find the Paschal candle it's supposed to be uh, close to the anvil. Outside of the Easter season, when this when Pentecost begins, um, then the Paschal candle should go by the uh, baptismal font. Whether it's over here, uh, some churches it's maybe in the back of church. So the Easter candle is blessed at the Easter vigil. Uh, that's at the very beginning, blessing the fire. 
blessing the candle, lighting it, bringing the candle around, proclaiming the light of Christ, and then it stays next to the candle for the whole 40 days uh, or 50 days of uh, Easter until Pentecost. With the season of Advent beginning today, you find, um, you might find, you traditionally find, but you might find an Advent wreath in church. The Advent wreath really is a home custom that has now been brought <coughs> into our churches for many, many years. But it's really a home custom. And it's, and again, there's so much with all of our uh, symbols in the church. Um, of course, we have a wreath, a circle, to remind us about God's unending love and eternity, just kind of going around and round and round. When they first started the Advent wreath, and again, helping us to anticipate the nativity, celebrate the nativity, the birth of Jesus on Christmas. It's also projecting like into the kingdom. That's why in these readings, the first couple weeks, talks about the end time. Not so much closer to, you know, we come into the birth of Jesus, but about the end of time. So originally, perhaps, this started as maybe a big wagon wheel that people had hanging. So imagine this hanging so that you'd be looking through the wreath, kind of looking through the wreath, into God's heavenly kingdom. That's how the Advent wreath kind of started. And then with the candles marking the time, uh, marking the time of the Sundays uh, as we go along in Advent. Now, um, so well, first of all, the wreath usually made of evergreens because it's, it's ever, it doesn't die. Um, <clears throat> traditionally, you'd also find a lot of laurel in Advent wreaths because laurel wreaths were made for champions, like when they were winning the, the Olympics or whatever, it'd be put a laurel wreath on. And then sometimes it would be, the Advent wreath would be mixed with holly because of the thorns that exist with the holly wreaths. So it's a combination reminding us of also Christ's death and his passion and then also the resurrection, the victory over sin and death. Now, um, I don't know who lit the first candle. Um, so the first candle lit today should have been this one because you like to, if you have, traditionally it's three violet candles and a pink candle. Ultimately, if you want to use four green ones or four whatever, I mean, it's to mark time. But if you have a rose colored candle, the first candle to be lit should be opposite it. This is for the third Sunday of Advent, a time of a little bit more rejoicing. So if you light that one first, it doesn't matter then if you go second or second, or you come around to third. Someone didn't light the right candle here this week. So you light each candle at the beginning of the week, uh, especially if you have an Advent wreath on your kitchen table. The uh, fourth candle this year will only burn for a couple hours because December 24th is the fourth Sunday of Advent. It's also Christmas Eve. So we really only have this year three weeks of Advent and then one day, because then it's Christmas Eve. So you'll tell them that they're- We've got a handout for that too. Yeah. But, so this is very nice. It, it kind of, uh, it's uh, nice and bright. So that's uh, the significance of the Advent wreath. Um, the anvil. Okay, why don't you move down this way? So we call this the anvil, a lot of people might just call it the pulpit. Um, this is where the sacred word of God is proclaimed. Now what should be proclaimed here would be the readings and the universal prayer or the prayers of the faithful. One should not be making announcements from here. Um, we reserve this as the table of the Lord, because there's two tables here. Table of the, of the word and table of the sacrifice. So this is where we make the proclamations of God's word that leads us then to the altar of sacrifice. So even that homily is meant to be kind of that bridge. So how is this word of God just proclaimed to us, active in the life today, that when we say, lift up your hearts, you know, in the preface before the Eucharistic prayer, it should lead us, give us a reason why 
because of what we just had proclaimed and how Christ is living and present with these readings today that moves us to this liturgy of thanksgiving, Eucharist meaning thanksgiving, that takes us then to the altar of sacrifice. Usually uh, around the anvil you find some, some candles. Again, candles are very traditionally part of church to kind of denote a special sacred area uh, or that something special is going on. That's how we kind of set things apart. Um, the altar, <coughs> keep coming this way. <coughs> the altar can take a number of different forms. It can be really rectangular. Sometimes you find now uh, just large square altars. What it's used for is of course, and what should be on the altar is just really the, the gifts and the book. So the book that's there is the Roman Missal. It has all the prayers in because us priests can't remember everything. So it has all the prayers of, uh, that we need to celebrate Mass throughout the whole year. The book that would be here is called the Lectionary. So this has, the Lectionary has all the readings of the church. Um, well, they'll get this at some point. So there's like Sunday readings, there's cycles A, B, and C. So there's a three-year cycle of the readings for Sundays, and weekdays there's a two, two-year cycle for weekday readings. So the, it's, you have the lectionary that proclaims the readings, the Roman Missal, previously it was called the Sacramentary, that's the book that's on the altar. You usually find the altar because it's sacred, it stands as the presence of Christ in the church. So when an altar is dedicated, like this would have been um, consecrated because it's rather permanent, can't move this. Uh, when it was consecrated, when the church was dedicated, uh, when, how many, 60 years ago, uh, because it stands as Christ, the bishop poured sacred chrism all over this altar. And again, chrism is that oil that sets us apart when we're baptized, when we confirm for holy order, for holy orders. So the whole altar top was covered with sacred chrism and then wiped off. The altar stands as a presence of Christ in the church. So when we come to celebrate Mass, there's a number of presences of Christ in the church. It certainly is the altar with the readings. That's the presence of Christ. The assembly is the presence of Christ. The whole body of Christ that's here is the presence of Christ. Then, of course, the sacred species, the body and blood of Jesus that's reserved. And that, of course, is kept in the tabernacle. So here the tabernacle is in the back center of the church. It's always been here. Traditionally, you might find it more gold or brass. Um, some number of years ago, you might find it be more wood. Um, it's not supposed to be glass now. It needs to be permanent, it needs to be fixed, so someone just can't pick it up and take it away. Because that, of course, is where we reserve the Blessed Sacrament. So Jesus is present there um, for the sick people who are sick, the dying, and then also for adoration. So we come in church, that's the living presence of Christ. Now, usually when you go into church and say, well, where, where is the tabernacle? Just kind of look for a candle. So we have one here, over there. That kind of lets you know that someplace in this area is the blessed sacrament, is the tabernacle. Um, Next to the altar, of course, and like next to the anvil, you have the altar candles. You have a processional cross that's carried in and out, usually for um, liturgies. You have the presider's chair or the presidential chair that's there, the one driving into that liturgy. And then you have chairs for other ministers, the deacon and servers and directors for Questions? What was the red one called again? The red candle. Candle. Just a sanctuary lamp. Candle or sanctuary lamp. Now, would that candle not be lit, let's say, during COVID, if there was a period, extended period where the church? No, was Jesus closed? was always in here. And so the candle's always lit. Yeah, except a couple of days when Jesus isn't here. Well, he's here. He's just not in his house. Um, Holy Thursday, Good Friday. And Holy Saturday, the Blessed Sacrament is removed from the tabernacle when we celebrate the Sacred Trinity. 
So even at the start of Holy Thursday night mass, the tabernacle should be empty. And the Blessed Sacrament is reserved in another place, even if it has to be in the sacristy. And then it, Jesus comes back into the tabernacle uh, after communion of the Easter vigil. So during the triduum, the door should be open, the candle should be hushed out. So when you see a candle, unless someone forgot to replace it, uh, that's a sign that Jesus is present in the Blessed Sacrament. And is it true what I read somewhere about the tabernacle and the altar no longer are wood because it's porous and potentially would soak in and hold the blood? If well, we're supposed to have chalices are supposed to be of solid substance, okay. preferably a, um, a precious metal. Um, but for a while, people were using glass. I mean, okay. that's not porous. So. Right, okay. But traditionally, you find chalices to be of precious metal. Um, might as well come up closer. So generally, um, have you gone through any of this with the gestures and bowing? Or anything? A little bit, okay. but go ahead. So um, if one is able to genuflect, when you kind of cross, and in this place with the tabernacle being in the center, um, People are encouraged to genuflect if they're going from one side to the other. With people who can't, you got bad knees or bad hips, then a um, profound bow would be something more from the waist. That's appropriate. Other, other bows would be just kind of from, from the head. A lot of times you see priests or others, when the name of Jesus is being said, they will bow their head a little bit. So um, this is the Roman Missal. This is chalice. Chalices can take, um, again, find all kinds of different styles, usually now of precious metal. Um, this is the purificator. The purificator is meant to purify. So after the, the blessed, um, after the precious blood is in the chalice, you would see that the priest pours water in <clears throat> to make sure there's no precious blood in here. And then it gets wiped out. And then uh, perhaps later in the sacristy washed again um, to make sure that we don't, you know, we, the re elements here of the body and blood of Jesus is very sacred to us. So we, we take great care, like not to try and put things down a normal sink or to have it go into the sewer. So that even these purificators, when people who are assigned to do the laundry, there's a process even of how to treat these. You, you're supposed to rinse them three different times and then that water, since there might be some precious blood that comes out of here into that water, then that water should again be just poured into the ground and not into a uh, sink that goes into the sewer. If you have the safety, I don't know how they do it. Yep. Uh, then this would be the patent. The patent, again, can be bigger, it can be smaller. The patent holds, of course, the host that's going to be consecrated. Um, this would be, cause a lot of things, but I think in your sheet, this is a lavabo bowl. It can be any type of bowl, big or small. For the washing of the hands, you see the priest washing the hands. This, again, um, two different types of cruets. I think on your sheet, you see ones with handles on or some, so, you have a container that holds water and a container that holds the wine. That's what we would call the cruets. These are, of course, um, you can call these patents. You can call these, um, usually a ciborium has a lid on it. So if you ever see, do you have a lid on? Yeah. The one that's in there has a lid on. So if you ever see them bring the Blessed Sacrament out of the tabernacle, it would have a lid on it. These are just used already filled with hosts to be consecrated to the next mass. And then afterwards, what is left over would then go into the tabernacle. So these could be, uh, either patents or communion bowls. It's really meant to contain the consecrated hosts that people receive at Holy Communion. Okay, no, it's in the, I think it's in the safe. Okay. So usually in the tabernacle is where you find maybe a bigger bowl like this, or you might find one more like a chalice that has a bowl with a lid on. And that's what distinguishes between a ciborium and a chalice, with having a lid on. Thank you.
Do you want to explain? Oh. Is this on here still, please? I don't know the, what the monstrance is, though. So I think you have on your sheet a thing that's called a monstrance, right? Uh, it's in one of them. So the monstrance holds, we call this a luna. So this is a consecrated host. So we would, the priest or deacon would take the monstrance and then this goes into the monstrance and then placed on the altar for exposition of the Blessed Sacrament or for adoration. So this is a host that's been consecrated, the body of Christ at some previous mass. And of course, since it's consecrated, we keep it again in a tabernacle that sets it apart. Okay? How about the pics? Is this one here? Yeah. There you go. That one's uh, gluten-free. Um, you find <clears throat> sometimes other containers. So this is what's called a pix, where <clears throat> if I'm taking communion to someone homebound or someone is coming forward, they have the authority to take communion home to their sick husband or wife or child. It's simply <clears throat> should be easier to open. There it is. It's just a container that holds the hosts. It could be one host or sometimes a, a homebound ministers might be going <clears throat> to five or six or ten homes. And then this is what they carry, the body of Christ, to those homes to distribute to people. Um, <clears throat> you find in some churches, if you can see this, uh, box that's in the wall. So many years ago, we would just keep small amounts of oil in a, in a wall in a container like that. In the past couple decades, it's uh, being displayed more like by the baptismal fountain like I, like I showed you. And this is just uh, a lot of places it would be called the credence table. It's kind of a, a table or, or spots on the side to put all these things on after mass or what the servers would use. So here it's kind of a niche there in the wall. Other places it could be a table that's behind the altar. Am I missing anything? Uh, Quick question. Yes. The uh, consecrated host that was in the Luna for the monstrance, mm -hmm. that, how is, what is, is the final disposition of that? Whatever that, whatever, would that ever be used? In Certainly by, by like Holy Thursday, we should be down to as few hosts as possible that we are reserving. Okay. So I think in a lot of places, I mean, some places they might break that host up every month and put in a new hosting. Or some places would say, well, okay, Holy Thursday is here. We, we um, empty everything and empty that so we can put a new host in come Easter or a couple days after Easter. Other questions? Can we go to the sacristy? Is it open? It's open. Okay. Let's head this way. <clears throat> Parts that people never really see. Controlled. Mm -hmm. Okay, this room is called the sacrifice. Everybody come in. You can come all the way around. If you tell anybody what you see in here, we're going to have to kill you. <laughs> no, just kidding. So this is where a lot of things are kept. Uh, as again, sometimes we put labels on here and um, we never change them. Because I was looking for uh, a corporal and that's not one of them. <clears throat> so you see on the, on the pictures, a corporal would be this, usually it's a square, 10 by 10, 20 by 20, fold it up upon which then we would place the, the chalice and the hose. 
<clears throat> and then it gets folded up <clears throat> usually after mass to make sure that if there is any tiniest fragments of, of the host when, when we break the host that it would stay within um, that core pro. Um, so you, you just find in sacristies places for all the different vestments, for all the different things that we use, a drawer for um, all the purificators that we talked about. I know at some place there on your sheet it talks about cinctures and I don't know. Cinctures are just uh, the rope that, the they're just a rope that the priest will use if he needs to, um, he doesn't use the cinctures. So. Uh, to tighten up the alb. So the alb is the alb is the first vestment that the priest would put on. Uh, you can tell who this belongs to. The big tall guy. So the alb is the first vestment that the priest puts on. It goes back to kind of your baptismal outfit when when you're baptized you're given a white garment. So in a sense all of you can sure should be wearing an alb. So the alb goes on first. Then sometimes if it's too long, it needs to be up. So then there's a, well, here's just a cloth cincture. It goes around and you tie it to make the, the elb more fitting. Uh, priests, then. So priests wear chasubles. Uh, chasubles have open sides like this. And under, usually you find under the chasuble is the stole that the priest wears. So it's the elb, the stole, then the chasuble. Monsignor, how does the priest wear the stole? The priest wears the stole over right and left shoulder straight down. Deacons, um, I don't know where the dramatics are. The deacon wears the stole over the left shoulder and then it would be joined like here at the hip and then go down. Okay, so it's, it goes across the chest for a deacon. Hmm. Um, and the, the dramatics of deacons, uh, they, they're the ones that have sleeves. They're in there. So this would be the Delmatic, do you see it has sleeves, let's have an open side, then you can see how this stole is slanted. Okay, so that's mm -hmm. the difference between the priest and deacon vestments. <coughs> Sometimes, <coughs> do you have a, do they have a coat on there? Uh, uh, I don't know where they're... I don't know. So sometimes you find like, a, I don't know you have that on the sheet, it's called a coat, it's, it just looks like yes. a huge cape. That you wear around and fasten. It almost looks like a shawl, yeah. like a big. Only down to the floor. Yeah. And then the humor veil. Humor veil goes over. That's no. Um, humor veil is what we use to expose the Blessed Sacrament and to make the sign of the cross or benediction with the monstrance. So it's another. That'd be more like the shawl that, that goes over the coat. Um, the coat is more like a cape. Yes. Like a long cape. Yep. Floor length. Um, the monstrance or the verbal? Uh, They're in the safe. Can I ask a question that everyone's yeah. thinking but no one will ask? Uh, <clears throat> like, does, is this dry cleaned? Or how, how does it maintain? Are you all thinking that? How does it maintain? <laughs> Someone else is thinking. Come on. Um, I mean, most of, most of the fine vestments are dry cleaned. Um, some, depending on what you buy, you some of the elves you can wash dry cleaner yourself. then, right? Oh, yeah. So, okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. So. Oh. Excuse me. First of all, this is the safe, and it has. I can't get. It, I can't get into it. It's. Uh, it's got a combination, but all of the sacred vessels are kept in the in the safe. They'll all be able to, mm -hmm. to walk in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is like a monstrance mm -hmm. that the Luna. Everyone is different. So this opens up, the Luna slides in here, and then the door is closed. 
and then this sits on the altar, and then this is what the priest uses to make the bless you as benediction time. And again, these come in various sizes, and various decorations. Um, and you all can take a step in is here. Is there a ciborium there? Huh? Is there a ciborium there? This would be the more traditional ciborium. It has a lid on it. And a chalice, of course, would just be, well, you all pretty much kind of, I think, know what chalices are right now. Um, there's a different monstrance for like a Eucharistic proce procession or a, mm -hmm. oh, okay. There's no. Just different sizes, okay. different makes. So uh, we call, I don't know what they call it <coughs> there, but we, we, in the church business, call this the boat. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. But this contains the grains of incense. It could be grains of incense. Sometimes it's just powder. This is what's placed on the hot coals that is in the thurible. So this is a thurible called the incense thing. Person who uses this, like a server, we would call the thurifer. But the hot coals, you put charcoals in here, you light them, then eventually when they get nice and white, you put the incense in, and that's what causes the smoke. Very interesting. Could you please comment quickly on uh, usage? Because I know, of course, some parishes you maybe even incense more the, the gospel book before the gospel. Certainly the altar in preparation of the gifts, or um, at the we incense a casket at the end of a funeral. Certainly a been a time of benediction. Um, sometimes we might use incense even at on Good Friday when we're bringing up veneration of the cross. It's in, even incense the, the cross. And, and part of that is also a lot of times too. Yeah. Is, okay. Yeah. Um, and the, the the priest might be incensed with this. A lot of times then when we do that, the rest of the priests and then the whole assembly, all of you would also then be incensed by the deacon or by a server. And when someone is incense, incensing you, um, it'd, be, it'd be appropriate, again, just to bow as they incense you. Okay? What's the significance of the incense? Well, it's kind of like as the smoke rises up, it's also our prayers rising up. And incense has been used in temple worship for long, long time. Now, when I say charcoal, it's, it's not like the charcoal you use at home. These are just little square, uh, not square, round pieces of charcoal we just light, and they put the incense on. It's very interesting, isn't it? It's rose-scented, because my senior likes it. Scent, I guess you might. Well, that would be the, the incense. The yeah. charcoal has no oh, yeah. scent. And there's all kinds of different flavors for uh, the incense. Okay, if you want to just maybe poke your head in there so you can say like you've been in the tobacco. Say, mm -hmm. There you go. Mm -hmm. uh, the aquarium's on the other side, right? Yes. And then when you come out of the safe, you can come on this other side. <coughs> hello, hello. We're just on a little tour here. Right, I'll go through all the way <laughs> Hi there, how are you doing? Okay. Yeah, that'd be like signatures for the servers that they have. Um, you don't, well, you do use bells. Hmm? Use bell. We don't, not usually. I thought you did. We did. Okay. I don't know. Good. They might be in the... Good. They might be in the... Um, okay. Safe. All right, so one of the important things in this room is the aquarium. So as I mentioned before, um, <clears throat> even the smallest part of the precious blood left in the chalice or anything that's blessed, even like holy water, you don't want it to go into the sewer system uh, because it's precious to us. So this side of the sink goes into the sewer system. This side of the sink goes directly into the ground. What? Um, that's awesome. Wait, that's not code. <laughs> <laughs> well, we only it's, we don't it's canon code. Yeah. So the only thing we put down here would be leftover water from purifying the vessels, or holy water. Um, everything else is washed this way. But the aquarium, that's why it's covered and sometimes locked, so people don't put all kinds of things down. So it's just really probably very little that goes in. So anything that's blessed, you really shouldn't throw away. So even like blessed palms, 
you know, you have them, you take them home on Sunday, you bring them back, you don't have to bring them back. Just dig a little hole in your backyard, light them, that's where they get buried and with the ashes. <coughs> Do not light palms in your fireplace or in your house because they stink. Or your grill. <laughs> so anything that's that's uh, blessed needs to be buried or burned. So that's why, again, like holy water stuff, you can always just put into your plants. Other things, things get broken, statues or something, um, you can easily just bury them. Or again, you probably don't want to... And sell statues. your house quicker. <laughs> yeah. um, we didn't really... The aspergillum, you've, you've seen, oh, it's back there. It's in the outside. safe. No, it's also back on the altar there for the Holy oh, uh, that's right. Blessing of the Advent week. Um, I think we basically, look at the Gospels. Um, it, it's exactly what it says. That just contains the Gospels. So not Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's the, the readings that we need for Sundays or other Gospels in the, the three-year cycle. So it just contains the Gospel accounts. Where the lectionary contains both Old Testament, New Testament readings, and the Gospel readings. The Ordo, probably on this other side, let's put that. This is great. <laughs> yeah, there is. <laughs> <laughs> but you can't fail. So. <laughs> That's right. Uh, I'm nervous. The uh, Ordo, so this is just would have been starting today. It's just a book that gives us directions uh, on what we need to do, where to find things, whether, fee whether days are... Uh, optional memorials, memorials, whether they're feasts, whether they're solemnities, what color to use, suggestions for masses, um, what masses we can do, can't do. So like on holy days, like this coming Friday, December 8th, can't have a, a funeral. So this is just kind of just gives us all the different little keys of what we can do and not do. Do as you don't. Yes. Is that still consulted often or someone like yourself who is knows most of that do you still need to refer to it once in a while uh i still do yeah uh -huh. some guys should and they they, they don't um but, they, but basically it's there as a reminder to us and sometimes again you think okay well so some some holy days are not holy days of obligation hello everyone hello, hello. 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 so like when um november 1st August 15th or January 1st falls on a Monday or Saturday. It's still a holy day, but not celebrated as a day of obligation. So this coming, well, next year, January 1st of 2024. Sure? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Just checking. Since uh, Mary, Mother of God, is, falls on Monday, it's not a holy day of obligation. We would still consider it a holy day. We still have mass, but you are dispensed of your obligation to come on that day. Okay. You have another question? No. Okay. Thank you. But Friday, Friday is a holy day of obligation. Friday is a holy day because Manca Conception is the patroness of the United States. So it's just all saints, August 15th and January 1st, that if it falls on Saturday or Monday, the, the obligation is not there. But also sometimes, was it last year? Um, so sometimes like December 8th falls on a Sunday the Sundays of Advent take precedence over other celebrations. So when December 8th falls on a Sunday, the celebration of the Immaculate Conception is moved to the next day, December 9th. But again, it's not a day of obligation to you. It's all very confusing, isn't it? Yeah. But that's why sometimes reminders like that are good. Other questions? We think we've covered everything here. I think so. Okay. So we're going to, to we're going to go back. We can actually go through the <coughs> sacristy door here, and just go back to the conference room. Okay.